Well, happy uh, TIFF Tuesday, everybody. And uh, thanks for bearing with us and getting through the snow. Uh, obviously, you plan an outdoor press conference in April and you're taking a chance. So thanks for coming to Montpelier. But, uh, and thanks to Mayor Watson for hosting us today at, here at City Hall in Montpelier. Uh, it's such an amazing place. And also, uh, really, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, a very relevant place to be having a conversation about tax increment financing. So uh, I want to start by saying earlier this year, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, commissioned what we believe to be the first independent analysis uh, of, the, of Vermont's tax increment financing program. It's a program that's been around for about 40 years. It's a program that uh, about 13 communities in Vermont have either used or considered using uh, or are considering actively using right now. Uh, and our members earlier this year came to us and, and told us, especially those that have used the tool to transform sections of their community, uh, they've told us for years that this is the most effective economic development tool they've ever uh, used. And without that uh, tool, those without access to the tool told us they want access to that most effective economic development tool. But there's a little trick, which is it takes uh, some work in the state house and with the governor to make sure that tool is available to municipalities. So VLCT partnered with uh, a Vermont firm right down in Heartland, uh, Rural Innovation Strategies, to conduct an analysis and questioned whether the TIF program was meeting the state's community development goals, uh, whether it was contributing to the state coffers or taking from them, and whether there were other more effective tools. Just because our members say it's great, we want to prove it and show to the legislature and to the governor's office that it's great. So the rural, we, we hired Rural Innovation Strategies. They, in turn, hired an economist and a team at the University of Wisconsin's uh, Oshkosh Center for Customized Research and Services to assist, including uh, the economist Jeffrey Sash, uh, who actually has experience in multiple government TIF programs. The findings in the analysis which uh, you can grab a copy right over there on the table. The findings of the analysis tell us that uh, they, they support the continued use of the program. In short, it's achieved the codified development goals here in Vermont. Uh, it's encouraging our communities to think long term. And perhaps most importantly, it's growing Vermont's tax base year over year. Uh, before I ask the city and town leaders that have joined us here, uh, to talk us through the findings and how they manifest themselves in practice on their streets. Uh, a quick reminder about what TIF is. Uh, real simple and oversimplified, Vermont's t tax increment financing law uh, allows a municipality to incur debt to make infrastructure payments uh, and make inf infrastructure investments and repay that debt using the increased tax revenue that that infrastructure generates. It's the gross oversimplification. Uh, we currently have about 11 active TIFs uh, here in Vermont and two retired TIFs. We currently have one TIF that is under consideration down in Killington. Uh, and perhaps most notably, uh, we have a TIF right here across the street. I don't believe City Hall's in the TIF, but I think it's across the street, right? Uh, here in Montpelier. And they're working on uh, making their first investments here in the next uh, months and years. Well, why now? Why did we decide to do this analysis today as opposed to last year or the year before? Well, uh, we've anticipated a multi-year TIF debate in the State House will come to a head this year. And sure enough, as we sit and stand and talk here in Mount Pelier City Hall in the Golden Dome, not a quarter mile away, there's a bill that will likely have action on the Senate floor today or tomorrow that would expand the TIF program. Uh, it's called the project-based TIF program, and it would simplify this program that only uh, about 13 communities in Vermont have had a chance to use so that rural communities could access it, people you hear from today. I want to thank the, especially the Senate Finance Committee, which uh, included this in an amendment uh, in committee to the Economic Development Bill, H-159. And I want to thank uh, members of the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs who have been supportive of expanding the tax increment financing program also. Uh, Vermont's VLCT's independent analysis of the TIF program uh, suggests that it's in the best interest of Vermont that the project-based TIF and H-159 becomes law. 
But don't take my word for it. Uh, I want to I want you to hear from people that have used the program and know a little more about the program and have had a chance to look at our analysis. And uh, I think there are several great examples, whether it be in Burlington with Mayor Weinberger and his team, who have really pioneered TIF and shown uh, what can happen on a, a lakefront that the city once turned its back to and redeveloped. But we have a more recent success story just to their south, and technically, I think, east, which I never get in the name of South Burlington. <laughs> which is uh, in South Burlington. And we asked Jesse Baker, the city manager in South Burlington, to come and tell us a little about City Center, but also to tell us about how this TIF program could help other communities. Jesse has the unique um, experience not only of working in South Burlington, uh, where they have an active TIF, but having been in one of our most successful TIFs in Winooski, uh, where she was city manager for multiple years, and where TIF has really transformed that city into what you see today from what it was when I was driving an ambulance through uh, that town 25 years ago. So without further ado, uh, Jesse Baker. Let me get out of your way, Eric. I'm too big. <laughs> uh, good morning. As Ted said, my name is Jesse Baker. I serve as the city manager in South Burlington, but I've also had the honor of seeing uh, TIF term, long term community driven planning into new tax dollars for the education fund, for new jobs, and for a sense of place in two different Vermont communities, both when I served as a city manager in Winooski and now as the current city manager in South Burlington. So, starting with Winooski, after decades of community conversation and planning, Winooski looks much different today than it did 20 years ago, with hundreds of new homes new restaurants and new businesses in, our down, in their downtown. I think it's of it still as my downtown as I still live in Winooski. Um, if you've attended a class at CCV, if you've gotten a student loan through VSAC, or if you've joined us for Halloween in Winooski where there are a thousand jack-o'-lanterns aligned around the rotary in Winooski, you've experienced the success of a TIF district. In South Burlington, where I currently serve, we've turned a suburban growth pattern on its head by creating a new densely developed downtown, our city center, featuring hundreds of affordable homes, a new library, a new city hall, and more market rate homes under construction. Even today on a snowy April morning, there are ex excavators in the ground. With TIFF, we are addressing our climate change goals by focusing development in our core downtown, on transit lines, and walkable and bikeable to over a thousand job opportunities. But if seeing and feeling and touching the product of TIFF isn't enough, the University of Wisconsin analysis spells out in numbers the success of this tool. In, in the six years they studied, Vermont's TIFF program paid for $180 million of public infrastructure in 12 dist TIFF districts. That generated $685 million in private development, more than half a billion dollars of investment in six years, and it created 4,000 new jobs. The University of Wisconsin analysis points to two key ways to measure the success of TIF programs, as an economic development tool and as a fiscal tool. Few policymakers have taken issue with its effectiveness as an economic development tool. And my comments, as my comments and the report suggest, Vermont's TIF program is effective in that manner. But this analysis also argues that Vermont's TIF is a TIF tool is a an effective financial tool as well. A net present value analysis in Winooski showed that the TIF program achieved a reasonable rate of return. It shows that by allowing 75% of the increase in property tax revenues attributable to TIF to be used to pay off debt, the education fund has more money than it, in it than if the, TIF, if the TIF districts had not happened. During the study period, the property tax contributions to the Ed Fund were estimated to have increased 68% compared to the pre-TIF contributions. Development that occurs in TIF in the TIF districts create a different, higher set of growth assumptions than previously reported by other researchers in Vermont. TIF provides both sufficient financial incentives and a planning framework that generates development that could not have occurred elsewhere. It engages the end and engages the community in a who are we and who do we want to be conversation with the financial tools attached to really enable the communities to realize the vision of who they are. Um, and it, is a, it has been very successful in my experience as a city manager. 
It is now my distinct honor to turn it over to, to a, one of my former colleagues, Ann Watson, the mayor of the great capital city of Montpelier. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, as Jesse said, my name is Ann Watson. I'm the mayor of Montpelier. And uh, right here in Montpelier, we actually have one of the newest TIFFs, uh, having just uh, been created a few years ago. And we in Montpelier intend to use our TIFF program to build uh, the public infrastructure that will catalyze the construction of affordable housing in our downtown, infill commercial development, and other private investment. Without TIF, more housing and more development would likely occur in green fields outside of, of the downtown uh, and throughout the county, leading to more vehicle trips, more carbon consumption, more traffic, and more forest fragmentation. The TIF program is one of the most effective tools uh, for state, local, uh, and, and federal tools that can incentivize smart growth, long-term planning, and fiscal responsibility. The program facilitates long-term community planning uh, and it also uh, requires communities to purposefully think about the infrastructure they need to spark economic development. Then they lay out a plan uh, to build that infrastructure. And once a community has bonded for that infrastructure, it can facilitate infill and dense compact development. A multi-year planning process that requires the community to vote in support of that plan is followed by five years of construction and a 20-year repayment period. The University of Wisconsin analysis shows that the TIF program accomplishes multiple development goals, including the goals codified in Vermont statute, enshrined in regional plans, and statewide economic development plans, and ultimately goals that are held by Vermonters. Vermont's TIF program encourages dense downtown development while preserving our working landscapes, and that is something I believe that we can all get behind. Thank you. Thank you. So just to reiterate a couple of quick points here, you heard from Jesse, it's an effective economic development tool. It is adding funds to the Ed Fund year over year, a 68% increase over that six year study. And perhaps uh, as Charlie Baker and our other regional planning commission directors would say, it's an effective planning tool. It's a long term planning tool that brings with it money and teeth, which is really, really important. Our next speaker uh, has been a select board member for 24, is that what we decided, 26? Uh, more than 25 years, how's that? That's what I should have said. A poor former board member of the Vermont League of Cities and town, Towns and uh, a select board member currently in the town of Johnson, Eric Osgood. Eric, all yours. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Ted. My name's Eric Osgood, select board member from Johnson. And I would say Johnson's not unlike many other communities around the state, size-wise, population-wise, uh, and our wealth-wise. Uh, TIF has, to this point, been sort of a too high a, a threshold for us to reach, and so we've not really taken, been able to take advantage of it. We have had some investments into our community, uh, some downtown redevelopment along the main street, We've had some flood mitigation measures taken to help businesses and some of the town's infrastructure. We have a small revolving loan fund that's f dedicated for revolving or uh, for uh, economic development. And so we have had some investment in our community in the growth and, and improvement of our community. We've also, uh, through the wisdom of the voters, purchased some property. And the intent is to develop that into a small industrial park. Um, we just have not been able to get over that hump yet, and I think with H-159 and the changes that uh, will lower the threshold for communities like Johnson to reach, that maybe we can get there and develop that site. And that requires all of the uh, infrastructure as far as power, water, sewer, that's all municipal uh, supported is there is just getting it onto the property, developing uh, the road, the infrastructure, that uh, type of development, and then hopefully get some uh, businesses in there. We think it's a win-win for the town and for the state. Uh, with that growth of uh, development, it brings in, increases our grand list, which is increasing our tax base, as well as uh, the job creation not only helps the uh, the state, but it also with the businesses, it would help uh, their education tax fund as well. 
So we think it's a win-win. Uh, we do support 159 and hope that it does pass. And with that, the smaller communities, such as Johnson and many others around the state, would be able to take advantage of the, the TIF. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So always get a smaller MC that can move around the podium more nimbly, sorry. <laughs> so as Eric just said, uh, the, the project-based TIF program in H159 is vitally important to make this program, which some of our bigger cities and bigger towns represented at this podium have been able to use. It's about equity and fairness to make sure the smallest of our towns have access to the same tools that the largest of our towns have access to, to invest in themselves going forward. On this TIF Tuesday, there are 10 findings in this report. What these people behind me have spoken about is not just their opinion, they're echoing the 10 findings in that report. One of the findings was that this tool, TIF, is a great balance between risk and reward, and a great balance of investment and accountability. And I thought there was nobody better to tell you why than somebody who used to run the tax increment financing program, somebody who used to be the director of the Vermont Economic Progress Council, somebody uh, who currently is a practitioner of economic development at the Addison County Economic Development Corporation, and that's the great legendary Fred Kenny. Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Yeah, I am Fred Kenny. I'm uh, executive director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation. I'm also currently president of the Regional Development Corporations of Vermont, the association of all 12 uh, RDCs in Vermont, and I'm representing them all here today. Um, so the University of Wisconsin report is the first known independent analysis of Vermont's TIF program. The report outlines what I've known for about two decades, that Vermont's TIF program is an effective development tool and a good investment. As the former state director of Vermont's TIF program and now as an economic development practitioner, I want to highlight uh, an important fact that was included in their analysis. The report concludes that the combination of safeguards that are built into Vermont's TIF statute maximizes its effectiveness and accountability while minimizing taxpayer risk. How does it do that? Well, Vermont restricts the type of taxes that can be used to repay the TIF debt. Many states allow sales taxes to be used. Vermont does not. Vermont has a shorter time frame uh, to repay the debt than most states. The minimal time period is typically 20 to 29 years. Many states offer 30 to 39 years. Vermont's is 20 years. Uh, Vermont is one of the only states to impose a cap on the number of TIF districts that can, that can be created. Nearly half the states in the country allow private developer costs to be financed, not in Vermont. Only 10 states require uh, state approval of a TIF district, including Vermont. And Vermont is one of the very small number of states that require uh, voter approval of TIF debt. Uh, while the project-based TIF proposal in H-159 would alleviate a lot of the minutia that legislation requires of the larger communities to access the regular TIF program, it would not reduce the transparency, the accountability, and the effectiveness of the TIF financing tool in Vermont. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. So I want to uh, conclude by bringing our attention to back to the report and back to the assessment and analysis that the University of Wisconsin and the Rural Innovation Strategies Group has done for us. And on page 19 of this report, there's a handy dandy table. And one of the big questions about TIF from its uh, opponents and proponents and what we, qu we really challenged the university to look at was, is this increasing the education fund? Because there are reports out there that make claims that it, uh, the TIF program actually costs the education fund money. Well, on page 19, figure six, there's a great, uh, a great uh, graph that shares a little about the anticipated growth of these TIF districts. According to uh, the most thorough review of the TIF program that's been done for the legislature by the JFO, the Joint Fiscal Office, they estimated that these TIF districts, if not for TIF, would have grown 18 0.4% in grand list value 
uh, over the life of, of the study, the six years. The actual return to Vermont and to the taxpayer was closer to a doubling, a 97.6% growth, growth rate. So this program is making growth happen in these TIFs at an astronomical rate. And the report goes into specifics and uses one community as a great example. Because one of the arguments against th this claim is that the growth would happen somewhere in Vermont without TIF. Well, this report does a case study of White River Junction. As we all know, White River Junction is unique in that it sits on a border of a state in a more favorable tax environment and a more devel uh, development-friendly uh, environment with New Hampshire. And in White River Junction, uh, in Hartford, the, the TIF was in White River Junction, so it's in Hartford, but it's in White River Junction. The JFO estimated the growth rate was going to be close to 44% over those six years. Now, I don't know about you, I didn't expect 44% growth in any of our downtowns over the past uh, six, seven, eight years, but that was the estimate. But even where that number was so high, the Hartford and White River Junction TIF district doubled the expectation for the growth in that town. And it is very easy to see that if not for in White River Junction, that could have easily happened in Lebanon. It could have easily happened somewhere across the border in Hanover and in New Hampshire. So a great argument that this program is doing its job. I'd encourage everyone to take a look at the report. It'll be on the website at vlct.org. And uh, uh, it has 10 great findings that have been echoed here today. But I want to end with these three reinforcements. This program is a proven effective economic development tool. This report backs that up. Uh, this program is an incredible long-term planning tool. This program is growing the Ed Fund. And this program in the entire country is one of the most accountable and transparent tax increment financing districts that's ever created. And I have to give credit to Fred Kenny and the team that over the years have built it that way. And to our friends in the legislature who have uh, ensured, despite our objections at times, that this program is what it is today, which is a really accountable, transparent program. And with that, I'd open it up to any questions for me or any of the brilliant people behind me that know more than I do. Calvin. I've got two questions. I'm not really sure. <clears throat> Maybe they're from you, Ted. I'm not sure who, to, I guess, is best to, to answer them. But can you just kind of walk me through what H-159 does specifically? I know you mentioned it expands TIFs to, uh, to, to more rural and, and smaller population centers. Kind of walk me through what changes would be in 159. Sure. So I can start, and uh, Fred might be able to uh, tell me more, because Fred was one of the uh, godfathers of the, the language. But so. H-159 and the project-based TIF makes TIF more scalable for a small town. So currently, when you do a TIF project, you identify hundreds of parcels in multiple projects over a five-year period of time that are going to be developed. Do I have that right? There's a 10-year period of time. Five-year period of time that you're going to develop a bunch of infrastructure over five years, and it's going to increase the value of, say, literally 100 or 200 properties, you know, parcels. The project-based TIF reduces that to say you have one project. And so you're going to do just a wastewater project or just a streetscape project. Your max cap is $5 million. Instead of with TIF, it can be much higher, you know, $20, $30 million. Uh, and you have a smaller number of uh, parcels that are going to be in there. You also have less time to do the project. So you have three years instead of five years, recognizing that this is a simpler project. You're not doing multiple projects. And uh, the... Uh, criteria for uh, what you're doing. I think with TIF, you have to meet X number of the criteria. With project-based TIF, it reduces the number of criteria that you need to meet, uh, recognizing that it's a smaller uh, project. So it really scales it. The nice thing, or some of our members would argue the trick with this, it doesn't alleviate any of the accountability or transparency measures that are in the existing TIF program. That's a complication for our members, but this report not only does it endorse project-based TIF, this endorse makes rec this report makes in recommendations on how the state should be helping our municipalities access this program by providing technical assistance uh, to our communities as they go through something like project-based TIF. Did I get that right? Anybody want to, Fred? Do you? I think you covered it pretty 
pretty <laughs> well. Um, I mean, for me, the biggest benefit of the project-based TIF uh, pilot that's in H-159 is that it makes TIF available to s small and more rural communities. Typically with TIF, you have a large area like a designated downtown, and the TIF is the whole designated downtown. Multiple projects, multiple infrastructure projects, multiple development projects. With project-based TIF, it's one project, as Ted said, maybe one or two infrastructure projects. So it's much easier for a smaller community that doesn't have extensive staff to um, administer the program and, and run the whole thing through the public approval process, the state approval process, and to administer the TIF. You know, I rem remember uh, Governor Scott back in, I think it was March or February of 2020, was talking about expanding TIF to smaller communities. In, and maybe this is a question for lawmakers too, but I mean, why why hasn't this happened? What's been holding this up? I could give that a shot as well. <laughs> you should ask the lawmakers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really telling though that in the Senate today, uh, they're likely going to act on an economic development bill that would expand project-based TIF and expand the TIF program into this pilot program, making the program more accessible to rural communities. So there are, th there is a lot of support for the idea of expanding TIF beyond the existing program and making sure that this is an equitable program, one that a rural town has just as much access to as a big town like Burlington or South Burlington. No offense, Burlington and South Burlington. <laughs> uh, I think that what this independent analysis does is hopefully explain once again that this program is putting money in the Ed Fund. There have been reports out there that have questioned that. And this is an independent analysis. When you look through this report, this is not saying that TIF is perfect and is the you know panacea to all, is going to be the solution to all of our problems. It points out some of the difficulties when measuring TIF. This says it's hard, it's complex to, to determine what this program has, uh, what the, the exact definitions of the su success in this program are. For instance, it says it's hard to measure the growth that happens outside of the TIF. When you have a project in Burlington or South Burlington, the downtown, that changes the waterfront and creates a city center, there are projects outside of that city center that benefit from the TIF program. Those aren't accounted for in any of the measurements. So some of these things simply aren't measured, and this report talks about that. However, what the report clearly says is the TIF program is putting money in the Ed Fund, it's supporting long-term economic uh, planning, uh, and it's uh, supporting the type of growth that we want in Vermont. So uh, I, I think go, making it simple is, you know, it's because it's a complex program and there hasn't been enough reporting to really prove the success of this program over 40 years and uh, we hope this report helps. Anybody else want to add to that? I went on too long. <laughs> Anything else, Calvin? David, do you have a stumper for us? <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank Mayor Weinberger for coming down. I want to thank uh, Mayor Watson and, and Fred and Jesse and Eric for making the trip on a snowy morning. And to everybody out there, especially to Charlie Baker and our friends at the Regional Planning Commissions for all the support they've given to economic development and planning and growth and, uh, and economic development tools out there. So thanks, safe drive home, and have a great day. Thank <laughs> 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 you.